Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we start with a new text today which is Siddharth Hassan Mantur's story uh, Toba Take Singh. I believe I've already given you an introduction to this text and a brief background to the cultural setting which produced this text which was one of uh, 1947 partition. Um, this is a story about madmen in Lahore and we talked about how interestingly the madmen's response to partition turns out to be a saner response, a more rational, a more human response compared to the supposedly rational responses which were done at a bureaucratic level. So essentially this is a story about exchanging madmen from India and Pakistan and uh, the, there's a rationale behind it which is that the Indian, uh, the Hindu uh, madmen in uh, Pakistan would be transported to India and the Muslim uh, madmen in India who were relatives in Pakistan would be transported across the border to Pakistan. Now obviously this mathematical formula of division is what makes the entire uh, experience of partition so absurd uh, at an existential human level because suddenly people were told they, the house that they grew up living, the house that ancestors had built and uh, had sort of you know, grew up living essentially belonged to a different country uh, and this whole idea of nation formation becomes uh, something like an absurd um, uh, act in this particular story and the lunatic's response to absurdity uh, becomes interestingly ironically uh, very very uh, human. Uh, it is perhaps the most human response available at that point of time. Now, uh, this story is of course, as I may have mentioned already, this story is also about uh, the whole idea of the entanglement between memory and space. So, how does a place become a space in the mind? Uh, so, a place which is an address, uh, it becomes more than just a physical location. Uh, how does it become something existential, something profound, something emotional? And it is emotive, existential, uh, spatial quality about a place, uh, the psychological quality about a place is what makes it uh, so embedded in terms of identity formation, in terms of identity location and identity articulation. Uh, to a certain extent this story is about a madman but it is also about a space and how the madman and the space blend into each other uh, because the protagonist in the story is a character called Bishan Singh uh, but he belongs to a village called Toba Teik Singh and you know after post partition uh, no one quite knows what Toba Teik Singh is. Uh, so he essentially becomes a space in a, in a very very metaphorical way. So, we will see how the story goes and we will begin at the beginning again just to give you the flavor of the story and then we will see how uh, the bigger issues of madness, partition, absurdity and dislocation uh, they all come into being in, in different degrees uh, of uh, you know alienation. So, this is how the story begins. Two or three years after the 1947 partition it occurred to the governments of India and Pakistan to exchange their lunatics in the same manner as they had exchanged their criminals. So again, uh, the way the criminals have been exchanged, the lunatics will also be exchanged. So again, look at the way in which lunatics and criminals are sort of almost equated with each other. These are the fallen citizens, these are the dysfunctional citizens, these are not the healthy citizens. So at the very outset, we have the idea of healthy citizenship, right? So one who doesn't fit into the healthy citizenship model uh, becomes a liability, becomes something like a dissident, something the marginalized presence in the uh, citizenship landscape, right? So this is how the story begins. So the criminals and lunatics were equated together, and now uh, it occurs to the two governments of uh, India and Pakistan to exchange uh, the lunatics just the same way that exchanged the criminals. So again we see the madhouse and a prison being a very similar kind of places, both are places of confinement and coercion, something we have seen already uh, in uh, a different degree in let us say uh, uh, Virginia Woolf's uh, novel Mrs. Jalloway. The Muslim lunatics in India were to be sent over to Pakistan and the Hindu and the Sikh lunatics in Pakistani asylums were to be handed over to India. So that was a deal that was arranged at a bureaucratic level. It was difficult to say whether the proposal made any sense or not. So look at the tongue-in-cheek uh, dry irony at play over here. Uh, Mantos Nareta over here is obviously a dry ironist. It is not really spelling out the irony, not spelling out the absurdity of it, but it is very much pointing towards the same, right? So it is difficult to say whether it made any sense or not, which is obviously suggesting or insinuating that 
it didn't make any sense at all, right? which is what quite clearly what the case was about the entire partition. It didn't make any sense at all to divide people based on religion, to divide people based on a mathematical principle uh, of cartographic, uh, mathematical principle of land and religion. Uh, that obviously uh, completely did away with any uh, understanding of emotion, any understanding of location, any understanding of uh, integration, etc. Uh, so, it, it was difficult to say as an narrator tells us whether the proposal made any sense or not. However, the decision had been taken at the topmost level on both sides. After high level conferences uh, were held a day was fixed for exchange of the lunatics. So, some very high level bureaucratic conferences were held in different countries and different cities, presumably in, in Islamabad and uh, Delhi. And then the bureaucrats decided on a date in which this partition, this, this swapping of madmen would occur. It was agreed that those Muslims uh, who had families in India would be permitted uh, to stay back while the rest would be escorted back to the border. Uh, since almost all the Hindus and Sikhs had uh, migrated from Pakistan, the question of retaining non-Muslim lunatics in Pakistan did not arise. All of them were to be taken to India. So again, as you go back and reread this, we find that how uh, it, it's so fascinatingly fabulous and, and fantastic uh, in, in a literal sense, in a fantastic and negative sense. It's got nothing logical about this and the whole idea of deporting and swapping uh, becomes uh, an absurd act. And this story in many sense is quite resonant with the uh, current uh, politics of deportation and immigration and exile, etc., where you know the identity is reduced to a number, reduced to certain metonymic signifiers, religion, name, race, uh, color skin, uh, language, etc. So all these become the markers of identity, the different boxes which are to be ticked. Uh, you know, uh, you know, on base of which uh, one's location is to be determined. So, you know, the whole idea of Hindu and Muslim lunatics over here are mathematically divided. So, the Hindu lunatics and the Sikh lunatics, who are, you know, who are in Pakistan, we just sent back to uh, India because there are no Hindus and Sikhs left in Pakistan, and the Muslim lunatics who. Uh, uh, had families in India were permitted to stay back. Otherwise, uh, if the families were in Pakistan, they would be sent back to Pakistan. Okay. Nobody knew what transpired in India, but so far as Pakistan was concerned, this, new cr this news created quite a stir in the lunatic asylum at Lahore. So, Lahore uh, being the site of this particular story, uh, the, the asylum in Lahore is where the setting, the action takes place. So, it was quite a stir, quite a, um, you know, a lot of rumor and controversy and a commotion that happened in that particular uh, madhouse when this news broke out, leading to all kinds of all sorts of funny developments. And you know, the word funny over here is obviously very ironic uh, because there is a lot of dark humor in the story. I mean, it is humorous, it is funny, but at the same time it is quite unsettling if you think about it in, in a deeper way. Because on the one hand, it is about madmen who are confused and they are obviously have no clue what is going on and sometimes we laugh at them sadistically, but at the same time they are their crisis becomes a very metonymic and very microcosmic representation of the bigger crisis of dislocation, or the bigger crisis of identity uh, lessness, of agency lessness. You do not really have any agency, you do not really choose where to go, it is chosen for you, and you have to just enter into a particular narrative, whether it is the Indian narrative or the Pakistani narrative. So, in, in some metafictional sense, you might push the argument and say, well, these are characters uh, who do not want to fit into any of these two novels, uh, the two novels being India and Pakistan, the two novels with employment, character, history, etc. Uh, two novels are being written. So, if you look at the nation as novels, uh, two narratives are being formed and these madmen are this liminal presence, um, these outsiders who really do not want to go anywhere apart from where they are and they want to go back to a pre-novel uh, space, a pre-nation space which is unavailable to them anymore. So, everything is post nation, uh, history is about to begin, uh, the national narrative is about to begin, the novel is about to begin, the two novels are in and Pakistan, they are about to begin now. So, it is a question of choosing one of these two and obviously the choice is not with the people over here, it is chosen for them. So, they just have to follow the orders in terms of their identity markets. If you are Hindu, you go to India, if you are a Muslim, you go to Pakistan, that is chosen for you whether you like it or not. So, again it becomes a very key question about agency lessness or will lessness in the context of partition over here. Uh, so, there was a lot of stir in the lunatic asylum at Lahore leading to all sorts of funny developments. A Muslim lunatic, a regular reader of the fiery Uddu daily Zamindar, when asked when, when, where Pakistan was, reflected for a while and then replied, do not know, there is a place in India known for manufacturing cut throat razors. Apparently satisfied, the friend asked no more questions. So, we have a series of uh, 
quasi nonsensical questions and answers over here. So someone asks, who, where is Pakistan? And there's a person who reads all kinds of very theory newspapers says, oh, don't you know? It's a place in India where they produce razors, uh, cutthroat razors. That's a place called Pakistan. And uh, the person who hears it becomes uh, is satisfied and goes away. So all these funny quasi or seemingly nonsensical question and answer sessions obviously uh, is reflective of the bigger nonsense of partition or the bigger absurdity of partition where people just don't know uh, why there's a need for two different nation states where in the process uh, millions of people get killed and dislocated and outraged and shamed uh, because of the religious markets. Likewise, a Sikh lunatic uh, asks another Sikh, uh, Sadaji, why are we being deported to India? We don't even know the language. The Sikh gave a knowing smile, but I know the language of Hindu Sodas. He replied, these bloody Indians, the way they trot about. So again, look at the way in which uh, language, religion, so all these different uh, things which are seen as identity markers, material markers, are actually more emotional in quality. You grow up speaking a particular language and then you transfer to another country, another place where they speak a different language simply because your religion happens to be in alliance with their religion. Well, if religion becomes a meta-narrative of identity over here, that obviously subsumes and consumes all the other micro-narratives of identity like language for instance. This was a very big issue apparently uh, in North India at that point in time because many people uh, many Hindus, quote unquote Hindus, who came from Pakistan during partition, well, they grew up speaking Urdu because they belonged to that part of the land. And when they came to, when they came to in Delhi or settled in northern parts of India, the language there, the more common language over there, the more commonly consumed language was Hindi, which is different from Urdu. Right? So again, uh, just because they happened to be religious the same, uh, they were dislocated and they were forced to be reintegrated into a different kind of culture altogether. So you can look at food, you can look at language, you can look at dress, all these different markets all these get subsumed completely and the one meta narrative, the one grand narrative of identity which is impairs on everyone during partition is that of religion. So that becomes a be all and end all over here. So if you're a Hindu, you go to X, if you're a Muslim, you go to Y and there's no other uh, in a liminal territory in between. So that becomes the major issue over here. So we find all these nonsensical questions over here, questions and answers are reflective of the nonsense and the, and the absurdity of dividing people simply on a basis of religion. And that, that becomes the most reductionist, the most barbarous, the most absurd and perhaps the most irrational uh, act of division ever done in the history of this subcontinent. Okay. One day while taking a bath, a Muslim lunatic yelled, Pakistan Zindabad, with such force that he slipped fell down the floor and was knocked unconscious. Again, these are quasi funny moments, but then we you know if you take a look deeply, these are not really funny at all. These are madmen trying to engage or trying to process uh, with the story of partition, which is just broken down on them, which is just broken out of them. And there is this Rip Van Winkle situation about the story as well. These are people who have essentially slept for so many years. They don't really know what's happening. They're not switched on about the current affairs. Uh, suddenly they are woken up and told that there are two countries now, India and Pakistan. So if you have religion X, you go to country A. If you have religion Y, you go to country B. And no one's asking you, no one's giving you the option of a third space, or rather the space where you grew up belonging uh, or grew up, uh, you know, living. You know, you don't have to go there. You don't need to go there. You're not asked to go there. Uh, you just ask you to go somewhere else which is determined and decided for you. And again, this whole idea of predetermination becomes important over here, whereas, whereby you lose your agency, you lose your authority to decide upon your own life and that is taken away from you and everything becomes very bureaucratically governed, very bureaucratically informed. So all the, there's a bigger Kafka bureaucracy somewhere up there. Uh, which takes the decisions for you and all you have to do is obey the orders that come from that kafka point. Okay, now we come to the uh, demography in the, in the asylum which is a very interesting kind of a mix because we are told immediately that you know this is a very mixed and hybrid and complex kind of a space where not everybody is a madman. There are people over here pretending to be mad because that, that's the only way they could escape the gallows. So there were criminals who now are put in with the mad people, someone bribed them uh, to get in there and bribed the authorities to get in there and get them away uh, just so uh, they could uh, be safe from uh, hanging or uh, other penal kinds of punishments. So we are told this as well in this section. Not all the inmates were insane, quite a few were murderous. To escape the gallows, the relatives had gotten them in by bribing the officials. So in that sense, the madhouse becomes a safe space because again, madness will protect you from legal retribution. If you do something out of madness, 
if you break the law out of madness, uh, the commonly consumed theory is you, you need medical help, you do not need legal retribution. So, madness becomes something of a license here as well uh, to escape the law, to escape the retribution of the law and that again becomes very complex. So, again if you take a look at the ontology of madness in the story, it is a very complex phenomenon. Sometimes it is more rational than what the supposedly rational world is and sometimes it is just feigning and performative, it is not really mad at all in, in a proper medical sense. Okay. Uh, so, these people who had just been there because they wanted to escape the gallows, they had only a vague idea about the division of India or what Pakistan was. They were utterly ignorant of the present situation. Newspapers hardly uh, ever gave the true picture and the asylum wardens were illiterates uh, from whose conversations they could glean nothing. So, these are the quote unquote sane people. So, they wanted to know what was really happening. So, they wanted to find out or glean information, collate information uh, from the uh, asylum wardens, but they got more and more adult talking to them because no one had any idea uh, about um, you know what was really going on. Okay, All that these inmates knew was that there was a man by the name uh, Qadir Azam and who had set up a separate state for Muslims called Pakistan. So, the reference obviously over here is uh, uh, Qadir Azam who is a reference to Muhammad Ali Zinnah. Uh, and Jinnah obviously is the first uh, statesman of uh, Pakistan, uh, he, he was the one who was a forerunner for that separate state etc. And now we, uh, these people are told there is someone called uh, Qadi Azam, uh, Muhammad Ali Zinnah and he had now uh, formed Pakistan and now all the Muslims over here must belong there and not to India. But uh, this is the important bit uh, and the funny bit as well, they had no idea where Pakistan was. So, again Pakistan becomes more of an idea to them rather than a real geopolitical location and suddenly they are told well this is Pakistan and then they will be asking questions completely uh, you know adult uh, questions such as well if this is Pakistan how come this is India just a few minutes ago and then where is India. So, it just given a new name a new classification and that classification that material uh, machinery to which new names are given, the material machinery to which new classifications in, in a geopolitical level occurs uh, that creates or that generates an existential dislocation. So, we can see how there is an equation over here between classification and dislocation right. So, that is something we should pay some attention to. Uh, okay. Uh, that was why they were all at a loss uh, whether they were now in India or in Pakistan. So, they are completely confused whether they are in India or in Pakistan. If they were in India, then where was Pakistan? If they were in Pakistan, then how come that only a short while ago they were in India? How could they be in India a short while ago and now suddenly in Pakistan? So, because it is divisions are very abruptly done, uh, they are done in a very ad hoc basis, it does not make any sense to them at all. These people who lived in this asylum for so many years and again you can take a look at the asylum as something of a space outside the mainstream political discourse. So, they, they outside it, the, the news have not uh, had not historically penetrated them. So, in a way they had lived a, a, in a revamical situation where they were outside this mainstream action and now suddenly they are woken up and they are told uh, that there is a two different country now and now they have to take a decision in terms of not decision is already taken for them, but they are just informed that they have to move uh, to a certain uh, locations depending on where the religious identities were. And obviously, from their perspective it becomes extremely absurd phenomenon and that absurdity is something just constantly hinted at in the story. Okay, so now we get all this again uh, this uh, funny quasi dark humorous uh, quality in the story as it comes up. One of the lunatics got so bewildered uh, with this India Pakistan Pakistan India rigmarole that one day while sweeping the flow he climbed up a tree and sitting on a branch harassed the people below for two hours uh, on end about the delicate problems of India and Pakistan. When the guards asked him to come down, he climbed up still higher and said, I do not want to live in India and Pakistan, I am going to make my home right here on this tree. So, again this is funny, this is absurd, this is irrational, uh, but this again becomes the most sane human response given the condition at this point. And th here is a man who says, I do not want to go to India, I do not want to Pakistan, I want to live in this tree. And the tree obviously becomes a symbol over here of the chosen space, of the agentic space, uh, the agentic location. This is a space where I want to belong, right. I do not want to go to India or Pakistan which have decided for me. Uh, rather, I will climb this tree and I will live here, uh, you know, and this because this is my choice. So, the choice of the madman that a choice of the madman assert over here, the, it becomes quite political in quality and sometimes subversive in quality as well. So, again this whole idea of living in the tree becomes important, I do not want to go to either of these two lands which are decided for me, I have decided for myself to live in this tree and that is an important decision. All this hubbub 
um, uh, affected, a radio engineer uh, with an MSc degree, a Muslim, a quiet man who took long walks by himself. One day he stripped off all his clothes, gave them to a guard and ran in the garden stark naked. So again, uh, the fact that he stripped off all his clothes, gave it to a guard and, and ran around naked, again becomes the irrational madman's act. But then again, this is no more absurd and no more mad than the entire idea of partition in the first place, right? So all these different micro models of madness that we see over here are reflective of the macro model of madness, which is the partition in the first place. The fact that he decided to create two landmasses by separating millions of people and in the process uh, so many people got killed and disintegrated and traumatized and because of the, some bureaucratic decisions taken at some Kafka's high level. So all these micro madnesses are actually reflective of the macro, the bigger, the grand narrative of madness which is the partition in the first place. Another Muslim inmate from uh, Chiniat, an erstwhile adherent of the Muslim League uh, who bathed 15 or 16 times a day suddenly gave up bathing. Uh, and as his name was Muhammad Ali, uh, he one day proclaimed that he was none other than Qadi Azam, Muhammad Ali Zina. Taking a cue from the Sikh, taking a cue from him, a Sikh announced that he was Master Tara Singh, the leader of the Sikhs. This could have led to open violence, but before any harm could be done, the two lunatics were declared dangerous and locked up in separate cells. So again, uh, what we see here is the politics of affiliation. Uh, so he, because his name is Muhammad Ali, he declares that he is Muhammad Ali Zina, the Qadi Azam. Seeing that, uh, another Sikh uh, declares himself to be Masa Tala Singh, the leader of the Sikhs. So again, the affiliation to the bigger macro models outside the asylum, that becomes important over here. And eventually, uh, both of them are declared dangerous and are locked up in separate cells. Again, uh, coercion, confinement, uh, these be become very, very important uh, categories over here, as we saw already in Mrs. Jalloway and, and Virginia Woolf. But this is obviously more graphic, more corporeal, etc. So these people are corporeally confined, corporeally coerced into a certain kind of existence, and they are uh, physically uh, handled uh, by uh, the guards and the, and the doctors and the protectors, presumably. Among the inmates of the asylum uh, was a Hindu lawyer from Lahore who had gone mad because of unrequited love. Uh, he was deeply pained when he learned that Amritsa, where the girl had lived, where his beloved had lived, uh, would now form a part of India. He roundly abused all the Hindu and Muslim leaders uh, who had conspired to divide India into two, thus making his beloved an, an Indian and him in Pakistani. When the talks with the exchange, on the exchange were finalized, his mad friends asked him to take heart since now he could go to India. But the young lawyer did not want to leave Lahore for he feared that his legal practice, um, for his legal practice in Amritsa. So again, uh, if you take a look at this uh, little passage over here, there are so many different kinds of moods at play. We have a Hindu lawyer uh, from Lahore who was also, uh, was obviously quite good, presumably quite good, but he had fallen in love with a, a girl from Amritsa. Um, uh, which now belongs to India. So he now is told that he was sent to India and that would presumably be good news for him because now he could go and meet his uh, beloved, his lady love who is now in Amritsar. But then the other, other tension comes to him and he says, well, I'm a lawyer over here, so what's going to happen to my practice? I want to be able to practice quite as well in Amritsar as I can over here in Lahore. So again, you have different undercurrents of thought, different sentiments, different affective tensions at play with each other, sometimes at war with each other. Uh, there were two Anglo-Indians in the European world. When informed the British were leaving, they spent hours together discussing the problems uh, that they'd be faced with. Would the European uh, world be abolished? Would they get breakfast instead of bread? Would they have to make do with the measly Indian chapatis? So again, uh, a different kind of dynamic is generated of a different kind of identity, identity which doesn't belong to Hindu or Muslim, but the Anglo-Indians, presumably Christians. Now, they're more concerned about uh, the degradation, the possible degradation of the food uh, so they're talking to each other, saying, that, well, what's going to happen to our breakfast? Will we still get our English breakfast? Uh, will it be reduced to suffering chapatis, which is, again, an Indian thing? So, again, this food markets become important as well. So, when the European world gets dissolved and people in the European world begin to eat chapatis instead of uh, bread, that transition of food obviously becomes a political transition as well because it opens up to readings of political change. Okay, so now we come to the uh, the protagonist in the story, uh, Bishan Singh. We, we get to know his character, we get to know his background, and obviously we get to know his eccentricities, which inform his uh, superiors of madness. There was a Sikh who had been admitted uh, into the asylum 15 years ago. Whenever he spoke, it was the same mysterious gibberish. Upa de Gugu de Anexa de Dhyadan the Moon, the Dal of the Lead Plain. So 
you know, what it roughly translates into is uh, the gods up in the high heaven don't have really any care for the quality of the dal, which is getting deteriorated every single day, which obviously doesn't make any sense because it's talking about the quality of dal, which is deteriorating every single day. Now, one may, uh, if uh, one wishes, do a reading of this, dal being a metaphor for domesticity, happiness, uh, nourishment, the thing that you consume to sustain yourself, etc. And when he says that dal is deteriorating and the gods do not care, what he's actually saying, what could he possibly be saying is uh, the quality of life, the sustenance of life, the thing which sustains you in life, the nourishment of life, all these are deteriorating dramatically and the gods in the high heaven simply do not care. So, this complete detachment uh, from any divine design uh, and instead this complete, uh, you know, participation or this forceful participation is some kind of an anarchy design is something which is hinted over here. So, the movement is from divinity to anarchy and that this particular nonsensical uh, you know r gibberish uh, may be read to interpret in a, in a way of interpreting this kind of a transition from a, a divine design uh, into a design less existence, into an agency less existence, into something which does not have any purpose or any meaning whatsoever, just a gradual deterioration, a very organic deterioration uh, of that which is supposed to sustain you uh, and comfort you. The guard said that he had not slept a wink in all this time, he would not even lie down to rest. His feet were swollen with constant standing and his calves had puffed out in the middle. But in spite of his agony, he never cared to lie down. So, again, this whole this, it becomes a very symbolic and graphic image if you think about it. His feet getting swollen and swollen, and the fact that he's standing all the time, he never sits down. It's almost like he is accumulating time, and it almost becomes a corporealization of time. So, he's accumulating time in his body. Uh, he has not uh, spoken to people for many years, he has not slept for many years, he just always stands, and no one has ever seen him sleeping. So, it becomes the entire the feet in his body, uh, the, the mass in his body, it just gets thicker and thicker, bigger and bigger, more and swollen. And that swollen quality is obviously reflective of the corporalization uh, of his, uh, of the temporality which informs him, which gets into him in that sense. Uh, he listened with rapt attention to all discussions about the exchange uh, of lunatics between in India and Pakistan. If someone asks his views on a subject, he would reply in a grave turn. Again, Upa de Gurgur, the annex today, uh, Bay Dhyana, the Mung, the Dal of Government of Pakistan. But later on, he started sub substituting the Government of Pakistan with Toba Teik Singh which was his hometown. So, the first time in the story we, we, we introduced this place Toba Teik Singh. So, that was his hometown, that is the place where he is obviously uh, effectively associated with or effectively attached to. Okay, so, again the whole debate away, the whole conflict over here is between your affective association and your effective association, right. So, affective A F F E C T V I E, the affective association is purely emotional in quality, whereas the effective association is politically driven, is politically motivated, is based on religious markers, religious divisions, etcetera, okay. Right, and we were also told that no one quite knows what Toba Teik Singh is, uh, is his hometown. Now he began asking where Toba Teik Singh was to go, but nobody seems seemed to know where it was. Those who tried to explain themselves got bogged down in another enigma, Sialkot, which we used to be in India, was now in Pakistan. At this rate, uh, it seemed as if Lahore, which is now in Pakistan, would slide over to India. Perhaps the whole of India might become Pakistan. It was also confusing, and who could say if both India and Pakistan might not entirely disappear on the, from the face of the earth one day? So again. These absurd assumptions are reflective of the bigger absurdity in question over here. What if India becomes Pakistan? What if the country of Pakistan gets dissolved into India? What if both countries disappear at one fine day? So, what is going to happen to all these ideas of identity, uh, citizenship, division, you know, all these things will just be completely meaningless. Now, the point here is, and I will stop at this point, the point here is uh, these are questions about the purposelessness of partition because they are also asking essentially that you know if we can divide one land mass into two, uh, who is to guarantee the two will not become three or four and how who is to guarantee that all these land masses will coalesce together to form one different land mass with a different name. So, what is going to stop that from happening, right? So, the whole idea of partition, of division, classification, reclassification, all these become very absurd activities over here which have no resonance whatsoever with the emotional location of these people. So, what we have in a nutshell is a complete 
uh, in a lack of synchrony, in a complete incompatibility as it were, a complete rupture as it were between the psychological location, the existential location and emotional location and on the other hand the geopolitical locations which are formed and manufactured ad hoc out of political necessities. So, on the one hand we have this ad hoc constructions of identity, the ad hoc manufacturing of identity in terms of giving names to landmarks etcetera and on the other hand we have this emotional existential locations and psychological locations which have nothing to do with this ad hoc uh, injunctions which are imposed on them. So, you know it again comes back to the question of agency, the complete lack of agency that these people suffer from and this madman's uh, rigmarole, the madman's question, the madman's interrogations, the madman's supposedly inane questions actually become very potent political questions at this point of time. So, this is the point we will stop today and we will continue with this in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.